What's going on, everybody? Happy Wednesday and happy new comic book day. Jen Mint here, going to review today's new comics as spoiler-free as possible. And I got to thank Glass Cabinet Hobbies for sponsoring this video. They have an exclusive variant for the new Batgirls number one. This one's drawn by Dan Mora. It releases on December 14th, and it's available to pre-order now at GlassCabinetHobbies.com. Make sure to check them out over on Facebook and Instagram as well with the same name. And pick up their variant. Show them some love. They're showing love to the channel. So first, I do have two books from Valiant. I think these came out a couple of weeks ago, but big shout out to Valiant. They sent a couple of comp copies through, and I guess I must have missed it because I did read Harbinger number one, and here we have issue two is out. This is by Colin Kelly, Jackson Lansing, Robbie Rodriguez, Rico Renzi, Hassan Otsme Alehu, and I think that's it. Um, here's the thing, man. It was a lot going on. It was a little bit much. I don't really dig like the whole writers during quarantine kind of incorporating that into the comics and stuff with like riots and, and all those kind of things so i don't know it kind of lost me a little bit the artwork was kind of all over the place and, and i'm not really clear on what's going on it does seem like there are some new sciats that are uprising and looking at peter stancheck as like i don't know like a a, a martyr or, or a figure that might not have, have even been real and, and peter shows himself but he kind of is matured he's not like gangbusters let's riot he turns himself in to avoid uh that riot escalating so i mean i dug it a little bit i think i'll stick with it but you know i just i, I get that we all went through the same thing in 2020 and it's like uh to reread it and relive it in comics i'm just not really with it uh and then exo man of war issue number eight this is by dennis hopeless aka hallam uh liaison toe forte romand and otsme alehu as well so Exo, my favorite Valiant character. I'm not sure if I missed any issues uh, prior to this, but it does seem like that Tony Stark S character broke bad like I thought he would. And this one is kind of like showing how I always forget the name of the armor. Shanhara? Sanhara? Shahara? There's some type of evil uh, clone doppelganger that this guy has whipped up and basically becoming an evil version of Exo. So it was all right. I think there's only one more issue of this series from what I can tell. All right, guys, on to this week's books, and let's start with Marvel. We have the last issue of Hellions, The Final Fate by Wells, Carlos, Segovio, and Burrito. So this is kind of like Orphan Maker on trial at the Quiet Council for killing two humans in the last issue, and I kind of like how it all comes together. You can kind of see by the cover a little bit. There's kind of a tease on there on how this ends. So I don't know. It ends. Hellions was fun. It was... Um, Probably one of my favorite titles out of the whole Reign of X, Dawn of X era. Nothing really big happened. I just enjoyed the characters. And uh, they kind of like give a, a little epilogue of what may happen with the characters moving forward. So interesting to see how they're incorporated. But yeah, it's done. Then we have X-Men Legends 9. This one's by Larry Hama, Billy Tan, and Chris Sotomayor. You gotta love that cover. Homage to Incredible Hulk 340, but you have three villains in the Blade, Sabretooth, Omega Red, and Lady Deathstrike. If you guys aren't really digging what's going on in the whole Krakoa era of X-Men, this is a good X-Book alternative. It takes place in between issues from the past, and it doesn't have anything to do with Krakoa or any of the Hickman stuff. And there's basically a Sabretooth Wolverine team up here uh, trying to prevent Omega Red from kidnapping children. So... Can't go wrong with that. Artwork is nostalgic. Not as strong as obviously like a Jim Lee kind of thing, but it was still a refreshing blast to the past of X-Men stuff. Then we have the Death of Doctor Strange tie-in with Blade. This one's by Lore, Burnett, and Spicer. Love Mike Spicer. I've been digging the Death of Doctor Strange one-shots. I feel like the Spider-Man one was stronger than the Spider-Man ongoing. I couldn't get into this book, man. Some callbacks to the Blade movies hanging out in a vampire club with the sprinklers of blood going on and what have you, but... I just found it really boring, man. It's kind of like uh, we're in this place where vampires are allowed to thrive and Blade is the security guard. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Dracula's in here as well. I couldn't really get into it. We have a Captain America Iron Man 1 here by Landy Unzueta and Rosenberg. Alex Ross covers. I kind of had fun with it. It, it kind of feels like the premise of Iron Man 3 except for... It's a, a woman that Tony Stark slept with in the beginning, and she ends up becoming a major player of Hydra and hates Tony Stark kind of a thing. I did like the banter between Captain America and Tony Stark, but um, yeah, I guess it was just okay. I'll try out issue two if, if this isn't just a one-shot. I don't even know, but it was just okay. Then we have Inferno issue three. Jonathan Hickman concluding his X-Men saga. He's joined by Silva, Caselli, Shitty, D. Benedito, and Carell. I think I always butcher... <laughs> 
half these names, man. So these are oversized issues, and I really feel like it gives Hickman some room to breathe and that he's actually telling the story he wants to tell. They have more time for just scenery stuff and kind of uh, just setting the tone and the mood of this book, tying into like the Nimrod stuff, as you can see on the cover, and how that all plays out with Moira going back to her and what's going to happen between Destiny, Mystique, and Moira McTaggart. So it's all falling into place, and it feels like a true epilogue to Hawks Pox. So I'm enjoying it, even though it's oversized. I kind of enjoyed every minute of it. Then we have Fantastic Four Life Story. This is issue five, Into the 2000s. This is by Mark Russell, Sean Isaacs, Carlos Mango, and Nolan Woodard. I've been liking this story a lot so far. This one... um, I don't even know how much I want to get into without spoiling it. Galactus coming is imminent, and everybody's kind of coming to grips with that. Reed Richards gets made an offer to spare his planet. If that sounds familiar, it's because it is. So this you know, takes a different path than what happens in canon, and it's touching. It's, it's heartfelt. There's a little bit of a twist at the end. It's not the last issue, so the 2010s are next. And uh, it leaves kind of on, on this big... I don't even know how I want to explain it. This big betrayal, which may or may not hurt them in the next issue. I'm intrigued. I'm ready for the next one. I like the art. I like the emotions involved. Great series. And then the last one for Marvel, we have Devil's Reign, issue one of six. Chip Zdarsky, he's joined by Chichetto and Menez. Basically, it's an extension of his ongoing. I'm not really sure why it was broken down into its own little mini-series as an epilogue to his run. Maybe because it includes... Uh, other Marvel heroes and it's it's basically the superhero registration act it feels very similar to Civil War in that aspect except Kingpin is enacting that in New York City putting a ban against heroes anybody using some, some type of superpowers or displaying any heroism heroism in public all this is because Kingpin went through his secret stash his files and he has a file labeled true identity of daredevil and inside he can't read it either it's not there or something is blocking his mind from reading it which is what the purple man did or was it the purple man's son uh, to make the world not aware that matt murdoch is daredevil because at one point everybody knew so he's filled with rage that somebody's messing with his mind he doesn't know the truth and he's kind of Doing that military tactic, if you don't want to do push-ups, I'm going to make everybody do push-ups and you just stand there. So it kind of makes you react. Does Daredevil turn himself in or does the Marvel superheroes band together to take down Kingpin? What do you think is going to happen? I dug it. It felt familiar. It was still fun and refreshing. It's a great team on the book. And I'll definitely uh, continue to read this one. I did like how they incorporated the Ben Riley Spider-Man, kind of keeping it in line with... Ha- with what's happening in canon here so i enjoy those little details all right guys let's jump over to image so we have lady mechanica issue number one by benitez satello and helsler uh i just flipped through this i, I get the pdfs of this kind of early and uh, I, I never heard of the title this is not the first that we have of lady mechanica but it's a new series horror inspired uh this kind of like battle angel uh, alita type of vibe to it i thought it was pretty dope man i'm going to continue to read it this character who's like yeah it's like ghost in the shell it's kind of like all those type of things like cyborg uh girl that that finds out that what's happened to her and horrifically uh moves like a robot and kills people so i thought it was pretty dope then on to nita haw's nightmare blog issue two this one's by rodney barnes welby jason sean alexander and lewis nct i really liked issue one i think it might have got pick of the week when it came out and i liked issue two as much if not even better it makes more sense why it's called nita haw's nightmare blog now although i still feel like the name is kind of terrible uh dealing with demons on earth um this outlet for people to kind of uh, reach out to if they're experiencing some type of paranormal activity. And that's what Nita Hall's blog is set up for. She has the ghost of her dead brother or something that's kind of guiding her and what makes her even believe in the supernatural stuff. And basically demons are possessing people and going on killing spree. So I guess they're going to try to stop them. I do like the cultural aspect they included here with like blues uh, musicians back in the day and record labels. I thought that was cool and uh, something that I'm familiar with and into. So I thought that was a nice uh, undertone to this horror based story. Uh, And yeah, I I dug it, man. Then we are on to Frontiersman, issue three by Patrick Kinlan and Marco uh, Ferrari. The art on the cover looks good. I mean, the art inside is okay. I'm just having kind of a hard time getting into this world because all these heroes are just 
new created heroes and it's a lot to like take in the frontiersman this old retired hero has been talked into helping this like ecolog ecological group to basically live in this tree house to avoid the tree from being destroyed and like this being public his old villains are coming to attack him and stuff and and yeah i mean i guess, I guess that's the basic premise but i don't know i'm just kind of Finding it hard to stay interested into this story. Then we have Two Moons by Arcudi, Gia Giordano, Nero, and Heisler. So, man, this is another one that I'm losing, like, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit lost in this one. Like, I understand this is during, like, the Revolutionary War. You have Native American, uh, this character that's on the American side, and then he starts to see this supernatural stuff occur. It feels almost like berserk in a sense. But I'm kind of losing like the key players and what's the actual point and plot going on here. Now, when they go on this rescue mission and they're attacked by like these demons, that's fun. The violence and the fighting is fun, but I'm just kind of like, yeah, like I said, a little bit lost. All right, then we have What's the Furthest Place from Here, issue number two by Boss and Rosenberg, also with Oatsmane Elehu working his ass off this week, guys. Another one where it's still it's it's purposely unclear on what's going on. It seems like it's post-apocalyptic, uh, that there's only really children that are around and adults are kind of like frowned upon. If you're harboring an adult, that's like a bad thing. These children are like broken up into these families that are in different territories, whether it's a record store or a Costco or whatever. Kind of has walking dead vibes and search for food and supplies. Uh, it's really broken down into these fast, short chapters, which I feel is like a little jarring to me. I don't know. I guess I still don't really get it. <laughs> all right, guys. Then we have the silver coin issue number seven, Rom V and Michael Walsh. First of all, shout out to Michael Walsh for recruiting the best writers of our generation here. Uh, Michael Walsh applying the artwork. Love this casino story. This guy that hits the jackpot and the silver coin is in that um, slot machine. I couldn't even think of the word. And of course, uh, it, it goes bad for him. Anybody who has this silver coin, it goes bad for him. He goes on this winning streak. He... He gets into it with his friend. He gets comped at the high rollers suite up in the top floor. But, you know, casinos don't really like winners like that. So, obviously, it goes bad for him. Great little horror series so far. Uh, anthology series. And glad to see that they're continue, continuing to put them out with great writers. A different writer on each book. Last one from Image. We have Crossover. This is Donny Cates, Jeff Shaw, D. Kanifi, and John J. Hill. So, this is like the super meta book. Like, this is basically for fans of comic books and comic book writers. Not like fans of superheroes, but like if you're a fan of like the comic book industry, you're going to love this book. Brian Michael Bendis appearance, Donny Cates putting himself into the book, putting Chip Zdarsky into the book in a Chip Zdarsky written issue. In this world where what if comic book characters were real and came to our world and were pissed to find out that these writers have been destroying their lives for decades and that they weren't in control of their own lives there's this dome that kind of is keeping everything together but the dome is expanding and getting weaker letting these comic book characters out a lot of cool easter eggs and uh, characters from other series showing up so like i said if you're a fan of the comic book industry you're gonna like this book all right guys from boom studios we have buffy the last vampire slayer this one's by casey gilly joe jaro and jayona la fuente so this is basically old woman Buffy. Now, I watched the show as a kid. I think I might have even watched Angel. Dope show. Joss Whedon directed it. And there is like a cult following in the collected edition community for the Buffy hardcovers. So I read this. I mean, it just plays out like old woman Buffy. Um, it's kind, There's kind of a truce between humans and vampires and slayers are outlawed. But obviously, she's a slayer at heart. There's another young person in here who feels like she may be a slayer, too. It's something that you're kind of born with. It's something inside of you. It was okay. I don't know. I'll pick it up. You know, if I have time, I'll, I'll read it. But uh, it was just all right. And then the last one from Boom, we have Basilisk, Issue 5 by Cullen Bunn, Jonas Scarf, and Alex Gumaris. Love this series. It's super dope, man. We kind of find out why the human character is so hell-bent on destroying these superpowered beings and... A little bit of a flashback to her past and what happened to her and her family, her daughter, her husband, and her on the road with one of those superpowered beings, the one that has a veil, kind of finding out that when one of them dies, they all get a little bit more powerful. So that kind of helps for the person that's on her side, but it's not looking good for the people that are against her who, who are super brutal. Like I think I always say, zero regard for human life. They are just like, they think they're the top of the food chain, and I guess they really are. And uh, it just makes for an epic showdown, especially when we see how this human is able to take them out one by one. One down so far, 
Let's see if that continues. All right, guys, let's jump over to DC Comics. And we have Batman issue 118 with a new creative team. We have Joshua Williamson, great writer. Jorge Molina, one of my favorite newer artists that I've been put on to. And we have Maury as well. So a new chapter. And this is post the events of uh, the Joker War, obviously post the events of Fear State. And I like how they even throw in the events from Detective Comics in here when Oracle's like Batman. You've been going through a lot lately. like So that all, all that stuff is canon together. So the premise of this book, it was very street level. You have like these criminals that are wanting to rob a store because they figure the Bat family are all out handling those bigger level things that are going on. But Batman's still around. He, uh, he ends up catching them. And it feels very much, like I said, like that street level vibe. But then Batman, right when he thinks he's going to be able to rest, um, there have been like five arrests from Batman Incorporated, these Batman protégés that he hasn't really been keeping tabs on, and it seems like they're guilty for what they're being accused of. Kind of a little twist at the end on who's been funding Batman Inc. since Bruce Wayne has stopped and lost his billions. I'm down for the ride on this new series. Almost got pick of the week. All right, guys, then let's go over to some DC horror. Not to be confused with DC Black Label, but we have Soul Plumber, issue number three of six by Parks, Zabrowski, Kissel, McRae, Holden, and Mike Spicer. This is a raunchy book. It's disgusting and vile and violent. I can't believe DC is publishing this. Even if it was under Black Label, like I would be surprised. And it feels like, like reading a Mad Magazine it feels like reading a cracked magazine it's kind of like that type of fart joke and and toilet humor uh it, it, it kind of lost me a little bit with this one i kind of was into the story for the first two issues and this one was just kind of like all right like what is this beavis and butthead on steroids or something like that you know so i'll probably stick with it you know halfway through three more issues we'll see how it goes all right, guys, next up we have World of Krypton, issue number one of a six-issue miniseries by Venditti, Omeg, and Filardi. This cover is very misleading. Don't give me a, is it a Miko Suyan cover? And then the interior is the complete opposite of that. The, the interior stuff looks like something out of, like, an animated series. Kind of boring. This is kind of the events of Krypton before the planet is destroyed. We're kind of seeing the families and Zod and how he's interacting with the elves and, and how the other family wants to take that house down and kind of leading up to the news that the planet's going to be destroyed. We kind of get a hint of some of the animal life on the planet just kind of giving up the will to live. The empath animals, if you will, knowing that something is wrong with the planet. The premise was okay enough. It just kind of, I don't know, it was a little bit boring. It was kind of like a gala for the entire uh, issue, and, and the art threw me off. Will I pick up issue six? I mean, if it's a slow week, next time it comes out, maybe. Then we got Crushing Lobo, issue seven of eight by Tamaki, Nahulpan, and Bon Villain. I'm sorry, I probably butchered that name. I'm just really impressed on how Tamaki's writing is so different on this book from her work on Detective in a good way. They're both uh, some very strong titles. I really love Detective. And Crush and Lobo is the Lobo book that everybody wants right now, especially in this issue. We get probably more Lobo than ever. A fight between Crush and Lobo. That was kind of weird. Like, dude, that's your daughter. This guy's a real scumbag, man. Uh, and her uh, bringing him back to prison as she was, as she agreed to, I guess I, sh I should say. And obviously, there's one more issue left, so that doesn't work out as well as she would have hoped. So, I've liked this series so far. Next up, we have Joker, a puzzle book, issue five by Rosenberg, Marino, Moneyham, Mooneyham, Williams II, Ariola, and Stevens. You know, it's pretty much the same thing with every issue. The Batman rogues gallery are being interrogated at GCPD, and they're all giving their own recants of what happened to Riddler in their own way, which is completely different, really. Some things are similar, but then a, a lot of the stories obviously don't line up, and it's kind of all like... What is he? What is even happening here, man? What is this puzzle box? What powers does it have? Is Riddler dead? What did it do? We don't really know. I don't know. This series is kind of weird. Like, I don't really understand the purpose of it. All right, guys. Then we have the Arkham City Order of the World issue three of six. This one is by Dan Waters, Danny, and Dave Stewart. Um, this one is also one that I'm having a hard time following. It has some cool ideas, like the Ten Finger Man has figured out that if you overlay the blueprint of Arkham Asylum over Gotham, the villain's cells, that's where they really are on the map. And like their psychiatrist who was working at Arkham to help them is finding out that this is true. And I don't know if she's falling into madness or if, I don't know, the things that the Ten Finger Man are saying and doing are uh, are true. She's kind of losing it, but... 
he's his plan or his uh, theory is kind of panning out, and the way that he kind of moves and like flips towards her, so, so weird, man. I don't know, having a hard time getting into this one. I, I'm starting to get it a little bit more, but. Yeah. All right, guys. Then we have Swamp Thing issue 10 out of 10. Psych extended to 16 issues by Ron V, Perkins, and Spicer. A beautifully drawn and colored book. First of all, Mike Spicer becoming one of my favorite colorists. Uh, The book is beautiful. Brother versus brother. Swamp Thing versus other Swamp Thing. Kind of a callback to that desert um, elemental that we met earlier in the run. And, and kind of leaving on this cliffhanger where maybe Ron V was going to leave it anyway, but now they're just going to continue it with this own series. I love it, man. It's it's the Swamp Thing book that we need right now. It feels very much like classic Swamp Thing stories from back in the day, but with a new character, Levi, with family issues and him trying to fight these corporations that don't give a damn about the planet. So... Yeah, man. Great series so far. Glad to see it's continuing. Then we have Batman 89, issue 4 out of 6. This is by Ham, Quinones, and Ito. This book is so crazy, man. First of all, it makes you think it's going to be like Superman 78. It makes you think it's going to be like the Batman, uh, third Batman movie from Tim Burton that we never got. It's so loosely based on that universe, it's not even funny, but I'm kind of digging it. I dig this version of Two-Face, this version of Robin. It does have the whole kind of what went down in 2020 in real life, but translated into comic book kind of trope. But I'm still having fun with it. Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne doesn't feel anything like the Michael Keaton version. He looks like him, but it's cool to see this like new origin story for Robin and this new Robin in this different universe. I can't, I can't lie, man. I had fun with it. And before I get into my pick of the week, guys, just real quick, I want to remind you that today at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be going live on Whatnot for an epic one-hour-long auction. Everything starts at a dollar, one-minute auction. Make sure to download the app. Use the link that's in the description or the pinned comments because it'll give you a $10 credit towards anything you buy on Whatnot. And when you use it, I get a $10 referral, so it's a win-win situation. But man, the best app to buy and sell comics, it's a YouTube live auction mixed with eBay, but none of the bad stuff, just all the good stuff in between those two platforms, all merged into one. Breakneck speed, super fun and fast, so join me tonight. And now for my pick of the week, Dark Knights of Steel, issue two by Tom Taylor, Putri, and Prianto. I love this, man. Tom Taylor. I was a huge fan of Tom Taylor. He recently has been doing a couple of questionable things. It's like, what are you doing, bro? This is the Tom Taylor that I know and love. This is the deceased Tom Taylor, the injustice Tom Taylor. I love this kind of Game of Thrones inspired world where we have the heroes that we know and love with a little bit of a twist. Factions and families are uh, rivals. I think, is it Blue Lightning that's on the one family? They didn't really make that clear. Really, the magic-based characters want to take out the House of L because they seem to be murdering magic-based uh, characters. Now they they haven't proved that, but they know that's like the only one that the only family that seems to gain something from that because that's their weakness, right? So uh, we have uh, Jor El was assassinated. Bruce Wayne finds out that he's actually his bastard son in the last issue. So him and Superman are half brothers here. I love it. The storytelling is great. The uh, the pacing is there. The stakes are there. It's just a huge, fun, epic tale. And those are the new comic book day reviews for this week. Man, it was a lot of books. Let me know what your favorites were in the comments down below. Hope to see you later today on Whatnot and stay minty fresh. Peace.